All right, let's welcome to the Misfit Nation, Yanni. How you doing, Yanni? I'm doing well. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks again for us both being flexible coming on to this and uh, getting this to where we are now. Thanks to the, the sick bugs and, and technological errors. We're back together here. This is awesome. I'm excited. I, I'm really excited. I'm glad that everybody's feeling better because yeah. being sick is awful. Yes, it is. And uh, I'm glad we were able to get this going. Uh, if you'd like to just introduce yourself to the audience, let them know a little bit about your background, where you come from, and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, so it, it's interesting. I uh, <laughs> I started twenty years ago. Twenty years ago as a pastor, I'm still an ordained pastor, um, but I was traveling around speaking, itinerant speaking, um, and I would have these leaders come up to me and say, "Okay, I, I heard what you're speaking about, but how do I implement? How do I do this?" Um, and back then. You know, coaching wasn't a thing. We didn't talk about coaching. Uh, I just said, hey, I was helping leaders be better leaders. Um, and I, that theme has carried through everything that I've done. I got out of the nonprofit world, uh, not fully out, but I, I stepped into the for-profit world for a while. Um, and I was at a Fortune 200 company. I was just doing sales, kind of slowing down a little bit gear shift if you will is maybe more appropriate and within 12 14 months i was a corporate trainer and corporate coach for them uh, i i would say in my own dispensation kind of a a god thing and then i became one of their top uh, corporate trainers and coaches i moved into a, a more of a management role um, that was focused heavily on coaching and uh and all throughout my career, I have been helping leaders be better leaders. That really came into view with uh, a company that I was working at that was specifically a coaching company. And we were specifically helping small businesses get out of founder selling, which was a really interesting concept, right? Because you have this product, you have this concept service idea, and you get out there, you start selling it, you're hiring people. And, and now you have to replicate yourself to a sales force. Well, a lot of these entrepreneurs, it's one thing to sell. It's something entirely different to build and run a sales team. So we were coaching them on how to do it and coaching them and then helping them do it. Uh, and then it just turned into full-scale business coaching. I ended up being the coach of the coaches and then the director of operations for that company. Uh, and a number of months ago, I, it it was finally time to step back out um, and launch my own uh, company, specifically focusing. And, it, and it's ironic, you know, if you look at our website, specifically focused to nonprofit uh, and, and ministry and pastors coaching that type of leadership. Uh, but I still absolutely do business coaching, uh, specifically around leadership. Uh, in fact, some of my best most fun business clients are I have a couple heads of chambers of commerce, which I find <laughs> radically interesting because most people don't realize the chamber is in and of itself a business. Um, and, you know, a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, is there a common thread among this? And there always is. There's a really old saying, it's like three or 4,000 years old. It says without vision, the people perish. And that is a incredible mantra of leadership that most leaders don't understand. And so when you look at these organizations, nonprofit or for-profit, they know I've got to sell this thing. We've got to do this thing. But whether they have five employees or 500 employees, if they don't have the right vision, all of those employees are going different directions because someone is going to come in and lead with vision. Um, and if it's not the top leader, then you're going to have vision going everywhere. And, and that the chaos that that creates, and that's really where I spend a lot of my time is helping those leaders understand where they are, where they want to be, and how to bridge that gap. Amazing. Uh, founder, the founders issue, I can see that being a big problem because you don't want to get let go of your baby. You started that baby. You don't want to let go. And little Joey or, or Josephine coming off the street to work for you. You don't know if you really want to trust them to take your baby out in public and, and make your sale for you. And then it's good to have someone like yourself to come in and say, look, you got to take the reins back or you're going to burn out. You're going to really burn out in your business. Well, that's exactly it. And, and it's interesting. I literally had this conversation with a business owner uh, yesterday that I was coaching 
Uh, she started, it's a, it's a great business. She started a coffee house, almost like a drive through coffee stand, uh, doing really well. I think she's up to like seven or eight employees. Um, but she is owner and manager oh. and she's ready to just be the owner and be the leader. But as we start, and it was slow, right? We were going slow. And as we started kind of walking through, I warned her that at the beginning, okay, I, I wrote on the board, this board here, I said, let go. She's like, let go of what? I said, we'll get there. We'll get there. And we're walking through, here's all the things that you do. And I said, well, what about this? And she, oh, well, oh, I mean, that's the uh, scheduling. That's the, you know, the business and the whole, and okay, do you want to be the manager or do you want to be the owner? And she goes, that's what you meant by let go, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Definitely. Um, but, but it's got to be done. Rich, it's got to be done the right way. Right. Um, and, and there's tips and tricks and techniques to make sure that it's done the right way. Um, and candidly, most people just, if this is their first go around or they're a young entrepreneur or candidly, they've run businesses before, but maybe never in this spot. That's where we really see a lot of people. They left the corporate world. They were successful leaders. They started their business, but it's different. It, when, you're, when you're a vice president of a Fortune 1000 company, and now you own a small business of 10 people, <laughs> there are other sides of the universe at times. It's yin and yang at that point. It's two totally different things. Totally different. Totally different. In today's world, though, where most businesses are online now, uh, thanks to Mr. COVID that came a couple of years ago, uh, e-commerce is up a, like a million percent probably right now. What mistakes are you seeing leaders making today that really affects their, their businesses? That's a great question. So I want to answer it um, a little bifurcated, starting with e-commerce, but then going to general business, okay. because the answer is actually very similar. A lot of companies have, like you said, put a focus on their e-commerce type business. Um, you see this for-profit, you see this in the nonprofit. The problem is, is that did you take a step back and really plan this out, right? Because a lot of people didn't. And, and my, my initial coaching is, okay, did you get where you are? maybe in the last four years or two years by doing what you've done in the last six months. And most people would respond to me, well, no. And I said, okay, there's a reason for that, right? What we're seeing is a lot of people are reacting when they built their business on a proactive approach. So for, for your listeners who are sitting here going, I don't understand why this isn't working. It's probably because you didn't do this the way that you started and ran your business, not with the same excellence, not with the same approach for a lot. And it, it depends on what your product or service is. But for a lot of companies, what they didn't realize is moving to a more e-commerce type thing is now a product within a product. It's 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 a it's a business line. Uh, a better way to think about this is if I say the word Microsoft, what do most people think? They think Microsoft Windows, right? They're a software company. Microsoft is one of the leading hardware companies within the computing space. They have an entire line called the Surface. Yeah. <laughs> but that business is a business within a business. Uh, the, the gentleman, he's a vice president who runs that. He runs it like his own company, right? So a lot of these entrepreneurs, a lot of these business owners launched thinking, oh, it's just an add-on, it's not an add-on. You have to run it with the same veracity. Uh, forgive me, my, my <laughs> wife keeps calling me. Hopefully she gets whatever answer she needs. Um, <laughs> and if you're watching this on, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Hopefully she never sees. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so it, what's really impactful though, is they didn't do it the same way. They didn't do it with the same excellence. Um, and, and that is one of the bigger mistakes. Now, can it be corrected? It absolutely can, but you've got to take a step back and, and identify here are the key steps that I did to get my business where it was 
okay, now I'm moving to an e-commerce situation. I need to take those initial same steps. I need to market in the same way. Um, a lot of companies took services and said, hey, let's put it on the internet. Okay, well, you didn't approach the market that way to begin with. Now, as a holistic, whether it's e-commerce or not e-commerce, one of the biggest problems that business owners have made through this COVID era is very similar to one of the biggest problems that they make. And that is they allowed what is really non-essentials to rechart their course. Here's what I mean by that. Okay, some states in the United States are still kind of shut down. Some states were shut down for a month, right? So some of it is going to be dependent on who I'm coaching and, and where they're at. But for the most part, most of this, unless you're in the restaurant business or the hospitality business, a lot of industry was affected, but not hard hit, right? So travel, hospitality, restaurant, whole different ballgame. But for most businesses, they, they took a shot and, and all of a sudden just started doing things different. I got to go to e-commerce. Whoa, time out. Why? Why do you have to go to e-commerce? Right? And, and I, you know, it's interesting. I talk about McDonald's a lot. Um, and no offense to McDonald's. I'm not the biggest fan of their food, actually. <laughs> um, but, but their business practices have been second to none. McDonald's was one of the first to shut down their lobbies and, and open up their drive throughs Okay, well, yeah, no big deal. They always had a drive through They moved to an e-commerce methodology, right? And they started delivering and really focusing on food delivery, food delivery. But they didn't just, oh, and then react. They threw themselves into it. Why? Because they weren't responding to COVID. They were responding to an adjustment in the industry. Completely different mindset. They saw the industry going a certain direction. So my statement to a lot of business owners is, did COVID affect your business for a few months or did your industry change? Good question. Yes. <laughs> That's a huge question, yes. right? That's a huge question because one of the problems that business owners are finding themselves in is they made a bunch of changes and put a ton of energy and money when their industry didn't change. It, it, it took a shot, right? It got punched. Um, now I get it, right? Muhammad Ali, I believe is famous. Uh, no, uh, Mike Tyson is famous for saying, hey, all your plans go out the window once you get punched in the face. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so... I, I, Rich, I would say that's probably one of the biggest things. And where does that come down to? Because these business owners weren't operating from a place of vision. They stood their business up. Money started coming in. They just kind of kept going with it. And because they didn't have vision, they weren't looking at market direction. And they, they couldn't make that adjustment, right? They couldn't sit back and say, hold on. My vision has always been this. COVID isn't changing this. I'm going to make some adjustments in the short term, but we're still moving the same direction that we need to go. Outstanding. And it's, it's kind of the knee-jerk reaction many of them did. As soon as this happened, you said, like, they take that shot, and I have to turn. I have to make this turn and move and pivot, like uh, Ross from Friends would say. You got to pivot, and they go this way. And they had no real plan. They didn't have their business plan in motion to do that. So then in all, uh, in an easy term, they, they likely got stuck. So how do they get from being stuck in that situation? Because now, like you said, some states are wide open. Like our state's been pretty much wide open the whole time. But some states are still like uh, the Northeast is still pretty locked down. They still have a lot of restrictions. What do they do to get their feet out of that mud and get unstuck? So it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because we talk about being stuck all the time. The very first thing... And anybody who's listening to this, if you're stuck, and, and let's back up for a second, even if it's not business, it, this, what I'm about to say is the answer for all humans. If you're stuck, the very first thing you have to do is admit that you're stuck. 
period, right? AA has everybody stand up and say, hi, my name is Yanni and I'm an alcoholic. Why? Because, and I'm not an alcoholic, by the way, but. Uh, <laughs> just got but, on date. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> hey, Rich, you just dated yourself because no one has anything on tape anymore. <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, so, but the power behind this is because when you're stuck, you have to admit that you're stuck. That's a powerful thing. Until you do that, you will continue to ignore what you need to do or keep your head down and keep barreling. Once you realize you're stuck, right? And, and let me put it into a different term. This, imagine somebody who's on the freeway pushing their car. What do you do? As a human being, you pull over. Oftentimes you'll get out and say, hey, can I help you push? And what if they responded to you and said, oh, no, no, I'm fine. Just driving my car down the road. <laughs> no, you, you're pushing your car. Do you need your car won't get? Oh, I'm fine. Just I'm just driving. We laugh at that, but that's what business owners do. That's what humans do. So if you're stuck, admit that you're stuck, and then ask yourself this question: Do I really have the capabilities, the training, and the knowledge to get unstuck by myself? Sometimes people do. Right? There are people who are listening to especially entrepreneurs and business owners who are taking a step back and nonprofit leaders, pastors who are taking a step back and going, you know what? He already gave me the answer. I know what I did before to build this. I got to go back and do the same things again. When you look at um, football or basketball or any sport, there are always what's called the fundamentals, right? <laughs> and so the greats practice the fundamentals. If you look at Tom Brady, he throws passes before every game. Why would Tom, oh, he's warming up his arm. He still has a passing coach, right? You look at Steph Curry, you, you look at some of these uh, all-time greats, they focus on the fundamentals. So if you're stuck, acknowledge that you're stuck. Identify, do you have the tools to get unstuck? And if you don't, then find somebody who does. There are people like me, who have been helping people get unstuck for a lot of years. And this is what we do, right? And so I come in, I sit down with these business owners, I sit down with these pastors, I sit down with these leaders and say, all right, tell me where you're stuck. Because everybody has their individual thing. Great, how did you get there? Okay, let's build a roadmap to get you out. Most of the time, the map is in the person. They just need somebody to draw it out and organize it, right? Think of me, think of me as a sketch artist. I'm a police sketch artist. Who the, the perpetrator is, that, that picture's in your brain. You just need me to help you sketch it out. And then I go, hey, is, is that it? And you go, yeah, that's the roadmap. And then comes the last piece, the accountability, right? Because today's, solutions cause tomorrow's problems. So not only do you need the accountability to stay on the roadmap all the way through, but if you had the ability to get unstuck all the way out, you would have done it by now. Right. So if you're, and this is the way we say, it, if you've been stuck more than three months, if you've had a problem that's gone unresolved more than three months, you're stuck. Get, get help from somebody who knows how to get you unstuck. And then stay with the program until you're doing 70 miles an hour down the e-commerce or business freeway. That's outstanding advice there. Uh, and also in the last two years, we talked about knee-jerk reaction earlier. I work for a company that's really big on the culture of the business and the culture in the office and the culture within the teams. So they really have a lot of knee-jerk reaction in our company. But we've seen around business, around nonprofits uh, that – they went into this whole culture deep dive to build the diversity because of events outside their realm to make sure everything was right. How does a manager or a leader deal with that situation? And, and first focus that, hey, we do have a good team. We don't have this problem or do we? And how do we fix that? So that is an interesting question because up to this point, we're talking about where the leader has been. And I love how you switched it to 
okay, this is where the team is. And, and there's really two ways to look at that. And I'm going to go with the way that you did of, okay, how does a manager, how does a leader deal with that? Same thing. Take a step back and ask yourself, is two questions, is my culture good? Just, just make it binary, good, bad. If it's bad, stop right there, right? And I'm going to tell you, don't even ask, do you need help? You need help. (laughs) If your culture is bad, you help get it to be there. And you probably can't get it out on your own. If your culture is good, then the next question is, is my culture where I want it to be? There's a vast difference between I have a good culture and it's where I want it to be. Once you have understood those things, then you have to start to take a look at designing culture, right? This is where a lot of leaders, this is where even mid-level managers, this is where they often go wrong. And that is they, they spend their time putting out the fires, putting out the fires, putting out the fires, as opposed to designing and building the culture that will subdue the fires to begin with. Uh, I I worked with a leader about a year ago, and this leader loved to be the one to come in and save the day. Loved it. It was a personal thing that he had. What that did, though, is it caused, it inadvertently caused his team to never cross the finish line. They'd get right up to that final mile, and then they'd kind of freeze. And he'd come in and save the day. And and the people who kind of reached out to him in a way and said, hey, help me cross the finish line, they actually did well. But his entire business stopped being scalable. Why? Because he had inadvertently created a culture where people did not have the tools that they needed. Now, the other part of culture is not just how things happen in the office. But it is the interconnection and, and the interperson, interpersonalness of business. And a lot of people go, oh, no, work from home. No, you're going to lose that working from home, right? You're going to lose that if everybody's not in the office. And what we're seeing is, no, no, a great leader continues to inspire great culture, <laughs> whether it's on a Zoom meeting. Or a team's meeting, it it, 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 it it doesn't matter. When COVID hit, I was in that coaching company that I told you about that eventually I became the director of operations. We never had an office. We were always a virtual company across the country. We had one of, even before I moved into leadership, we had one of the best cultures I had ever worked in. Why? Because culture is a human thing that you address with humans, but all the way back to being proactive. Is it different? Of course it's different, right? Well, I just stroll into someone's office. Okay, well, sometimes that means you're a jerk. (laughs) You shouldn't be strolling into someone's office, right? But by the way, it's just as easy to instant message them and say, hey, do you have two minutes? Let me chat. I can't tell you how many times that happened. What COVID... I should say what the response to COVID did, all it did was shine spotlights on what's already there. Your culture's great. It's because you had somebody who proactively made it great. It's still going to be great. If your culture sucked, it, and, and sorry to be so brash about it, but it probably always did. And you had things covering it, not allowing you to see the really... I mean, honestly, here's what happens. I can't tell you how many leaders are like, oh, I have a great culture. Really tell me about your turnover. Well, it's higher than I want. Higher than I want. That's as coaches, we go, oh, so it sucks. You're not willing to admit that it sucks. And you've just told me that it's probably due to culture. Yeah. You admitted it. <laughs> you, you just admitted it. You just didn't hear yourself admit it. And I think that goes back to our earlier discussion, identifying that you have a problem and not wanting to. And that, that's a very big point right there. 
in in everything that we do working with leaders, nonprofit, for profit, business, so much of this is them acknowledging their problem. And what's interesting, I'm going to call out the for prop uh, the nonprofits for a second. You would think the nonprofits would be much more adept at doing that. They're not. And I'm going to tell you why. In for-profit, it's, it's, it's a very simple equation. Red or black. And I'm not talking roulette. Yeah. I'm talking about profits. Right. Is your right. company making profit? Are you making year-over-year profit? Are you, making, are you hitting the profit goals? If you're not, your job has a short expiration date on it. And you know it. So you'll, go, you'll do whatever you need to do to get into the profit. So in the for-profit world, there's this outside motivation of, in the nonprofit world, people can, well, you know, you know, we, we're paying our bills and so, okay, but you, you're in the steady decline year after year after year, you have a problem, you are stuck. Yeah, and a lot of times in the nonprofit world, like you said, it's lackadaisical because all we have to do in, in December, we'll start asking for all our donations because people like to give in December because then they can claim it on their taxes right at the end of the year. And that's when they're most likely to give it. Well, not everyone's going to give it now. If you don't do things all year long, if you're not pushing your product all year long, yeah, you're a nonprofit, but you still have a product. What are you doing with that nonprofit? Are you helping the homeless? Are you feeding children? What are you doing? And that's what you have to do. You have to constantly fight that battle to push it out for 12 months, not just that two week window in December before Christmas. Well, and, and Rich, think about what you just said. The person in the for-profit business is turning a profit. That is their goal. And they are highly focused on it. And they often acknowledge when they need help. Now, for-profit has a problem when the profit is there and the goals are there, but it's not sustainable. I'm talking to you, business leader, who you know you have a problem in the back of your mind that's going to bring you garbage, that's going to corrupt what you're doing in a year, two, or three years, but the books look good now, right? So that's the for-profit world. Everything looks good now, but you know in the back of your mind, your culture is going to corrupt you. It already has. You're, you're not scalable. You can't grow. I'm working with a leader right now who literally came to me and said, Yanni, we're doing great. I said, awesome. Why do you need me? They said, because our goal was here. We're right here. And, and we have this ceiling. I need you to help me get above this thing. We've got to raise the ceiling. Awesome. That is a proactive person. By the way, the ceiling raising is going extremely well. Nice. Right? Okay, so those you for-profit people, when the books look good, you can hide the other problems. Stop doing that. But in the nonprofit world, Rich, you're exactly right. Ah, we'll just get we'll get uh, donations at, at the end of, of the year and we'll make all our bills. It's not about your bills. You're feeding the homeless. Right. You're, 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 you're doing disaster relief. You're a, you're a connected with FEMA. Like these are people's lives and, and you should have more excellence. You should be leading the way. Sorry. I'm, uh, if you can't tell I'm passionate about this, Just a bit. you should be leading the way to say our organization has a problem and we are going to three months, three months. If you have big or small, if you have had a problem, nonprofit or for-profit, that has lasted more than three months, you are stuck. And I'm going to tell you, any problem that is stuck will go from small to big quicker than you can imagine. Exactly. And then all that was perfect. And I mean, I right now for the last, I think, five or six years, every time I run or do some kind of physical activity, I donate to a specific nonprofit organization because they are doing things right. And I stayed with them this whole time. I haven't changed my, my donations. It all goes to them this whole time because they do it all year long. And I see it all year long. They're always pumping it out there. And I'll continue to do it to them until they fold or they decide, oh, we're not gonna do this anymore. Rich, what's interesting is you in the business world have become with this nonprofit what we would consider a repeat customer, right? You, you, you're a lifelong customer. You're a repeat customer. You're just the nonprofit version, but you said it, 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 it's all business. 
the other thing that, that is crazy to me, nonprofit, let's try this a different way. It's a 501c3. That is the part of the tax code that allows for a nonprofit corporation. You're still a business. You're still a business. You still have to lead. You still have responsibility. You just are not for profit business. So don't hide behind that. COVID, for again, other than I know some of you in some states, things have been tougher. I get it. And in some industries, it's been disastrous. But for the majority of people, COVID just was a spotlight. Your business, if it sucked in COVID for a lot of you, it, it did before. And COVID just shined that spotlight. You should take this as a, take COVID as a business intervention. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen that show, right? Yes. But <laughs> the, the COVID was a business intervention. And if you did not listen to it, what is it going to take for you to realize I can be better? I want to be better. I need to be better. Rich, can I give some practical stuff on how to do that? Yeah, quick. Uh, two minutes. Perfect. The most important thing is do you have a vision statement? Do you have a purpose statement? Do you have a mission statement? If you don't know what those things are, you need to call someone like me. <laughs> okay. If you have that, it should tell you where you're going in the next couple of years. Then do you have a roadmap, something literally built out that says, this is how I get from today to that vision statement. If you don't have that, you need to call someone like me. And you need to build those out. They are not just hoops to jump through. They are literally the steps that you get to take to reach your goals. That's it. Pretty simple. <laughs> it's it's pretty. It's it's pretty VPM, simple. VPM. That's it right there. It it shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to treat COVID or whatever next thing happens as your Gordon Ramsay or Bar Rescue to come save your your business. You should be on it with your VPM and sometimes getting a, a coach like yourself or a motivator to go in there and just say, "Look, this you might want to tweak this a little bit so your ceiling can rise, and that way you don't hit that ceiling, keep back in your head, and get a concussion and stop and get stuck." <laughs> Yanni, this has been great. How does someone get in touch with you to have you come in and maybe give them these pointers? Yeah, so I appreciate you asking that. So our website is gratsllc.com, G-R-A-T-S-L-L-C.com. Um, again, it's very dedicated to pastors and nonprofit world, um, but you for-profit folks come, right? There's, there's room and space for you. Um, my number is 208-207-9806. And some people would be like, you're giving me your phone number? Yeah, because coaching is a human thing. At the end of the day, this is about you as a leader. So, and it doesn't need to be me. There are tons of me's out there, but you got to, if you're going to be successful, you got to find someone who can help you get there, period. Outstanding. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks for taking some of your time to be on the Misfit Nation. Thanks, Rich. Bye, everybody.